Good morning, um, and uh, welcome back to Denison Theater this morning. I uh, just first, I th this this plenary evolved out of um, really a, a unique partnership for me instead of collaborations for me, and I've got to recognize Le Lisa Eby and Vicky Dreitz for um, for just being so supportive and providing a a bridge um, between our boundaries among ourselves and, 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 and among the different sectors of the society that, that made this possible. So I wanted to thank them. And uh, Eleanor Sterling and myself um, had the privilege of, of, of organizing this plenary, but also with Doug Clark from the University of Saskatchewan, and I wanted to recognize him as well because he's the one face, um, well, you'll see the back of his, his body right there, but you won't see him looking. Um, so as you may have seen in the, in the program, and, and as, as I think has been advertised, we're talking today um, about cultural boundaries. And the kinds of cultural boundaries that we have to bridge, that we seek to bridge in our endeavors, our social endeavors, our biological endeavors, um, to achieve our goals as conservation biologists. And I just wanted to tell a really quick story, I think, that captures why this is really important for our society. So about 25 years ago, I was drawn to New Guinea by its forests, by its birds. And when I got there, there were forests, endless forests in New Guinea. And I remember finding myself in those forests and thinking, this place is amazing. The people are incredible. They don't, they don't need me here. Um, but working for WCS, I dug in in this little village and I had all the accoutrements of a, of a field biologist. I had binoculars, I had mist nets, I had little things to trap lizards. I was gung-ho, you know, 20-something, just bright-eyed, this is awesome. And there, were, there was a little shed, right? This shed had, had keys in it, uh, the lock with keys, and the, this old man asked me to, to give him the keys. And every morning, this is my, almost a year, every morning, his son, this young boy would come and give me the keys every single morning. I couldn't get up early enough for that kid not to be sitting on my stoop with the keys. The old man never came. And many, many years later, um, you know, I was kind of getting a little gray hairs in my beard and a little bald up here. I went back and um, I sat with the old man. His son had died and, um, and he wasn't long to follow. And uh, I sat with him. Uh, the shed had rotted away. And I asked him about the keys. And he said, well, you know, when you first got here, all I wanted was the, I wanted to give the keys to that door you kept opening. Whatever door you came out of, I wanted to give it to, to my children, to the young people. He said, now what I realize is what I wanted to do is give those guys those keys and watch them throw them away into the bushes. And at that moment, I realized that there was this massive gap between my conceptions of what I was doing and this sense of this desire for self-determination and choice in this other world, this other set of cultures that I was interacting with. And whether you conceive of a forest for its trees, its ecology, or you see it as all history and all time for you as a person, um, whether you conceive of biological diversity as the variety of life on Earth and all the processes that maintain it and all that, or whether you see it as something that's on your body and songs, um, wherever you seek your um, wisdom from, um, whatever texts guide your work and ideas, um, whoever inspires you, um, and whoever your teachers are, no matter what, where you gain those things, no matter where your sort of ethical uh, guides are, I think it's critical to think about how we travel into places, um, who we travel with, in our everyday lives. We're conservation biologists everywhere we are. Um, and I think it's critical to understand that in many contexts, the people around us, often the most silent and quiet people around us, can provide ethical, spiritual, and scientific compasses for our work. Right, the world has gotten, to, the, the challenges before us are too great for us to do, do any of this alone, right? We need all the richness that humanity provides to confront the challenges before us. And to do that, everywhere we go, everything we do, we need to bridge cultural boundaries. And those boundaries are not just in, in how we hold and interact with the natural world. 
Obviously, these are boundaries of race, they're boundaries of gender, they're boundaries of identity, of intellect. When we say culture today, that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about all the variety that is our humanity. And I think it becomes most clear uh, when we think about who the next generation of conservation biologists are going to be. I mean, if we think about how our demographics are changing um, and who we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, that's evolving and changing daily. And any of you who've worked across political boundaries, as we talked about in one of the plenaries, or um, other administrative boundaries, or even disciplinary boundaries, these cultural gaps and divides that need to be bridged, that sense of self-determination, um, right, who's holding the keys, is something we're constantly confronting. So, I really believe that as a society, these are issues we need to address, and I think there are a lot of eyes on us right now. Um, all different eyes on us as a society to look at how we are going to bridge the variety of boundaries, cultural boundaries of, of ethnic, race, identity, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and so I think we, we really need to step up and take, and take a, a leadership role in terms of how we bridge, bridge these gaps. Um, we're, we've got an exceptional group of people here today. We're missing one person who was really dear to me. If any of you were at my talk yesterday, I spoke about this as well. Jess Hausty, a tribal member from the Hiltzuk community. Um, this is part of their traditional territory. Um, will not be here today, um, but we've got uh, more time with the four exceptional people here. And we also have Eleanor Sterling, who really needs no introduction in this room. She, um, gosh, over almost 20 years, led the development of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation that I uh, work with now at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and I'll say one, th I mean, she's an incredible mentor of mine and many people in this room. But uh, the one thing I wanna mention is that she, and actually Leo Douglas, who's on the panel as well, co-lead the diversity pa um, panel on what committee subcommittee, um, there's a cultural boundary right there, um, but they lead the, cult, the diversity subcommittee for this society, which is really trying to address these kind of in the trenches on, on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. Um, so, Eleanor, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to sit down. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I hope you can see the relevance of this, and I'm just excited um, to be a part of the discussion you guys are going to have. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to the organizers for um, inviting us to be here. It's been really exciting to, to get to know panelists. Some of them I knew from, uh, f have known for a long time and we're renewing ties in a different way, and some folks I'm just getting to know, and it's really been a, tr a treat, a, a pleasure, and I hope we can share that effectively with each of you. So the plan for this morning is that I'm gonna be posing a set of questions to get us warmed up and to allow the audience to get to know the panelists. And then fairly uh, quickly, we're gonna open this up so we have at least a half an hour of time for you all to ask questions and interact with the panelists. So be thinking of good questions to engage with these terrific people. Um, what I chose to do this morning is have each of us identify ourselves and, and in part that's to help you all understand ways that we can transition boundaries. Um, Self-identification is extremely important in, um, in discussions and in working across boundaries. And um, I know when I was in Hawaii and having a discussion with some of the community members, there were some very tense moments and we spent a week together doing things and moving from place to place. And at the end of the meeting, we were, at the end of the week, we were having dinner um, together. And I made some comments saying I'm a conservation biologist. And every, all the community members at the table said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean? They said, you're not a conservation biologist. Conservation biologists do this. And you don't do that, so you're not a conservation biologist. And they said, hang on, I get to self-define. I'm a conservation biologist. So how you define yourself and allowing people the space to define themselves and just say what that means to them can sometimes really help in crossing these boundaries. So, and, and each of us redefines ourselves in different contexts. So in the context of this panel and of the Society of Conservation Biology, I am a conservation biologist. I have over 30 years of experience in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, crossing borders, crossing boundaries, cultural, um, disciplinary, 
um, really loved being able to do that and learn from other people. I was the director of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation for over 15 years, and I'm very happy to say as of two weeks ago, I'm now the chief conservation scientist, and we have the new director in our audience. Um, I'm also an aunt of 26 nephews and nieces, and, um, and one of my nieces is in the audience, Katie Toretti. It's her first time in a meeting, and I'd love for you to seek her out, talk to her, find out what she's here for, share your experiences, and do that with anybody else who you feel is new to this audience so we can be an inclusive group. So um, let's have Kiki introduce herself now. Um, it's a song, yeah, okay. My name's Kiki Jenkins. I consider myself a marine conservation scientist. Um, in terms of identities that are really important to me, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and my family spent every summer fishing and crabbing on the bay. Uh, and that was really pivotal to ending up where I am doing marine conservation. It's also the bridge that I use for a lot of my work because I interact with fishermen, I study conservation technologies, and particularly how the culture in which they're being used influences how they're developed and people's willingness to adopt them. And so I can draw on that identity as someone who grew up fishing and crabbing, be it recreationally, as a bridge to why fishing and crabbing is important to them as a profession. Um, I have worked in Ecuador and Costa Rica, but I've also worked in different regions of the US, from North Carolina to Texas and all along the West Coast, and there are huge cultural differences there. Um, and then also just looking at smaller cultural differences. For example, National Marine Fishery Service, their headquarters and how they operate versus their centers that are in the regions. And those huge cultural differences do affect how conservation is played out. Um, so those are some of the things that I work on. Thank you, Kiki. Kiki. Hest squext pesia. Nhuesque lui squest. Germain lui siapi squest. Tin lempti yet loi. Lem lempsh til Chris. Lem lempsh til Eleanor. Lem lempsh til Kiki, Leo, Linnea. Lem lempsh til pesia. Um. It's appropriate in my culture to, um, to, to greet you all this morning and thank you for coming here to our Aboriginal territory and to introduce myself. Um, my name is Germaine. I, I'm a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes and I work in tribal government in the Division of Fish, Wildlife, Recreation and Conservation and I have the delightful pleasure of being an information and education liaison um, within the tribes and also with the outside community. Before coming to the Natural Resources Department, I worked for the Salish Pond Array Culture Committee and had um, the deep honor of working with our culture bearers, our elders. So. My work with our fisheries and wildlife scientists is really framed by that cultural background. I'm delighted to be here and um, look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. Jeez, thank you. Um, my name is Linnea Workman. Um, I am a member of the Champagne-Ajac First Nation. Uh, my Indian name is Talande. I am a member of the Wolf Clan and Southern Toshone ancestry. Um, and of course, and additionally in my way, I want to thank you for welcoming into your, your homeland. Um, and Montana's great, I love it here. Um, my history is, um, I'm a, I, I only have an undergraduate uh, compared to a lot of people here that have their doctorates and postdocs and what have you. Um, but I've been working with my First Nation for, well, since about 1991 as the manager slash director of, of their fish and wildlife programs. Um, I've worked extensively with um, large carnivores, ungulates, and um, mostly anadromous salmon species. 
Um, I've worked on a wide range of, of projects that my First Nation has um, developed and implemented and put on the ground. I've worked with many researchers and um, worked on a lot of different programs with both our territorial and the federal government over the years. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Leo Douglas, and I'm uh, Jamaican. Happy to be here and very happy to be participating in this forum. Just to give you a little idea of what brought me here to conservation, um, my parents were farmers and I was, grew up very fascinated seeing them, you know, putting the forest into the soil, uh, cutting down forests, creating areas that cattle would, uh, would, would be farmed, and plowing under the, the plants into the ground. You know, while that was happening and I was in the fields, I was always very interested in the bromeliads and the birds and the lizards and everything that was there and fascinated by them. And I was very much a collector, as I guess so many young boys were. So I would collect these things and I was interested in them. And this interest continued until I was in high school. And I think a very pivotal thing happened during that time I was in high school. I remember I found this brochure and it was from the United Nations Environmental Program in Kenya. And I wrote to them, and the letter went off, and months passed, and I completely forgot about this. But uh, a little slip came that there was a package at the post office, and when I collected the package, it was a box, a pretty heavy box, actually. And in that box, there were posters and things about global warming and forests and animals, and I was like, wow. And, you know, I really wish that um, I had the opportunity to thank whoever sent that box because it really changed how I saw animals, that, you know, people could actually do this for a living and study this and, you know, have a career in this. And I went on to tell people in my high school about what was in that box, and even my teacher gave me the opportunity to make a presentation about uh, deforestation, you know, and it was all based on stuff that was coming out of that box, because it wasn't stuff that we were learning in high school. And I went on to uh, uh, study birds um, uh, with a German professor who was working in Jamaica, and um, went on to work with a USAID project where I got very interested in these human dimensions aspects, realizing how key those were, which led me to a PhD which I did with Anna Luz Porsokansky, my PhD advisor who is sitting here, and Eleanor Sterling. And uh, so that's kind of how I, um, I developed to where I am. And I'm looking forward today in terms of discussing these very important issues of cross-cultural conservation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to all the panelists. So I'm going to open this morning by asking you to, to share with us a little bit about um, what contributes to success in crossing these boundaries. Each of you has a wealth of experience in doing so. So maybe for, for setting the stage for the audience, we can talk a little bit about what's, what's worked for you. What, what has been something that's been successful for you in your efforts to, try, to cross these cultural boundaries? Jump in. Okay. Um, well, for me, one of the very important things is recognizing that even though I have this bridge that I mentioned of a family history of doing recreational fishing and crabbing, it only gets me so far. It can get me into the door with some goodwill, but there's a lot that I don't understand about the cultures where I go and I work, be that the culture of Ecuador or the culture of um, California fishing. And so I really look for what I call my safe space. That when I'm starting to do research, I find someone who I either know very well, who I have a lot of social capital with, um, who also knows the fishery well, knows the cultural context well, and that's where I go and I run all of my interview instruments, survey instruments, all the thoughts and ideas that I have, the hypotheses that I want to test, and I treat it as a dry run where I'm allowed to make all the mistakes in the world and I know that I have enough social capital that can smooth over any faux pas. And that's been pivotally important for me because I think sometimes I go in the field and like, I get this, I know what's going on, I've read everything there is to know. And they've said to me, oh my goodness, you cannot ask this question to this community because there is a history of this, 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 and this that has happened here and they will code you as being part of this group that has mistreated them. I would never have known. 
And of course, then we have to figure out, well, what's a different way that I can get that information? So that safe space is something that I tell all my students when I'm teaching them classes, how to, different methods classes. It's important for them to find and to cultivate. If they don't have it, they need to find a colleague who has it and is willing to put their social capital on the, on the table and cover for you in case you make some faux pas in that space so that when you go out into the larger world, you don't have to worry about problems that you can't smooth over that would really throw your research and your relationships with that community into a bind. So that's one thing I do. That sounds great. It's a great tip having a sounding board and someone that you've developed a deep trust relationship with so they don't get mad at you for asking the questions and you learn so much from them about and you can share with them why you thought to ask the question. Good. Jermaine. One of the success stories we have in crossing cultural boundaries um, was in the establishment of the first tribal wilderness, the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. Um, it, it's um, over 90,000 acres of stunningly beautiful landscape. And it's also an extraordinarily important place for grizzly bears. And um, in the heart of the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness, we set aside 10,000 acres as a grizzly bear management area it was critically important to, to set that aside because of a couple of reasons. Um, there's a large hatch of army cutworm, uh, army cutworms that are high quality, as you know, high quality protein and really important for the viability of, of grizzly bears in, in the missions. But for us culturally, grizzly bears are the leader of the animals. They're, um, they're the chief of the animals, and it's important for us to ensure their well-being as, as the leaders of the animals that, that we rely on. So in order to um, avoid human-bear conflict, we close that 10,000-acre grizzly bear management area from July 1 to October 1 to all human activity, and it's closed and enforced. Um, there are also some other unique attributes of, of the wilderness. Um, we have a buffer zone, and it's meant to be just that, buffer the noise and the activity of the valley from the solitude and quiet of, of the wilderness. Um, establishing the first tribal wilderness in the nation was, um, was a, a bit of a challenge there was some confusion about the way we use that language. People continued to say, well, is it a federal wilderness? And we said, no, it's a, it's a tribal wilderness. And there was some curiosity. Um, at, at the same time that we um, established the grizzly bear management area, the state of Montana continued to issue hunting permits for grizzly bears. So we were really going against the state grain, the national grain, but we were clearly following a set of traditional tribal values that, that guided us. And, and um, we were informed by the elders. We were um, guided by tribal history, by our cultural values, and um, all those cultural imperatives that were important for us. And, um, I, I think it's a wonderful success story. And my understanding is that, that the U.S. government then followed your government in, in embracing some of these ideas and these modes of, of thinking about the bear and, and made some changes in their management strategies as well? Yes. As a matter of fact, there's a greater sense of understanding that grizzly bears require large landscapes that are connected, that are... Uh, that are healthy and that our population was also the population that was in the second range in the in the Swan Valley in the in the federal wilderness on the other side of the missions and also the grizzly bears that traveled into the Bob Marshall wilderness so all of this complex of of wilderness was was critical for a healthy bear uh, healthy bear populations and now there's a good working relationship between 
um, state conservation scientists, uh, conservation biologists, and federal conservation biologists, and tribal conservation biologists. Thank you. That's a lovely story. Um, similar to uh, what, what Jermaine was talking about, um, my First Nation is a self-governing First Nation in, in Canada. And what that means is, is we've fought long and hard, in fact, a, about a 30-year negotiation um, that enabled us to be able to govern ourselves um, and live more of a, I guess, follow, follow our traditions and our culture and, and have that um, expressed through any uh, legislation or, or programming that we develop. Um, one, just kind of very similar, um, one, incidents that, that we had, or I guess it would a story. Um, there was, back in 1992, we had uh, the federal government release about 170 bison within our traditional territory. And there was no consultation that had occurred with the First Nation whatsoever. So obviously that created um, some issues. Um, we worked with, tried to work with the territorial government um, for several years and there was some management plans that were developed, but it was never, we were never in a situation where we felt we were empowered to, to, to be part of the program. And so finally, um, it came to an impasse, both the First Nation and the government. We, we just, that was an impasse. My First Nation wanted their concerns dealt with. Uh, these bison were on our lands. Um, we wanted to be part of the process. We wanted to be able to make some of the decisions. We wanted open. We wanted transparency and honesty from the government. And most of all, our community needed to be part of it so that, that um, they could feel empowered um, by the project itself and feel some or experience some of the benefits associated with having these bison on the land. Now we have to remember that bison hadn't been on the land for about 300 years. Um, so we had no history with these animals whatsoever. So how we tried to deal with it, um, we recognized it was a government program, it was a government initiative as part of Canada's national recovery strategy. Um, so the First Nation and the Yukon government created um, basically two parts. There was a technical team that was created, and that, was, that, that team was the information gather, right from, from the grandpa to political people. Um, we dealt with all of the technical information. We dealt with all of the traditional and local information that came in. It was kind of that, that just collection type place where everybody was welcome and anybody could come to us. And then the other part that, that we did was we, the decision making process. And we created what was called a management team, but it really only had two people. And that was the director of the First Nation and the director from Yukon government, and they made the decisions. And it was based on recommendations that came from the technical team. And this was really, really important to our people because it gave them the opportunity to be making decisions, but be part of those decisions. Um, it allowed people in the community to bring their ideas forward, um, it, whether it was on how we should be hunting them, on how um, we need to address trappers' issues because hunters are out there in the winter, just a full range. And what it did was it really, really allowed people to see that it wasn't just all negative. Now, this, there's still challenges, and we've been at it for about, well, over 15 years now, but I think it's a really good example of how when something's been dropped in our lap, how we've been able to work with the government um, and try and turn things around so it's more of a positive for us. And bringing multiple evidence to the table, yeah. I'm going to take up upon that point because I think some really good points were made in terms of trust, transparency, and involvement. So we're talking about working 
cross-culturally and the successes of that. And there's one uh, example that comes to mind that I'd really like to talk about. It's that of uh, the Jamaica Parrot Project. So the Jamaica Parrot Project was started by a PhD student who came from Yale and who came to do a project about nesting success and parrot survival in Jamaica. But it really, for me at least, epitomizes these ideas about how, you know, when you hear trust, transparency, and involvement, it initially kind of sounds very touchy-feely and all, oh my God, you know, haven't we heard that already? But believe me, it, in practice, it makes or breaks these ideas of working across cultures. You, sometimes we forget how our own identities, whatever those are in terms of our gender, how we dress, uh, or, or ethnicity, how these things can impact on our work. But we can overcome these things, and we can do successful projects. In the case of the Jamaica Pirate Project, what happened, you had a female uh, white American woman who was going into rural Jamaica. Many people would not do that as a PhD uh, advisor. You know, Jamaica has this image as being a very dangerous, rough and tumble country. Why would you send a woman there into the forest, into rural communities to, to, to do work? In this case, though, uh, uh, this individual went, she was studying her parrots, but she was also meeting people where they are in their own spaces and building these issues of trust, transparency, and involvement. She would go to the local rum bar and hang out with the, uh, the, the, the guys. And, you know, sure, you know, they would pass some little sly remark, but she, she handled them professionally. You know, they'd be playing dominoes, and she would join in the domino game. Uh, you know, she didn't call this grand town hall meeting, said, you know, please meet, you know, we're serving wine and cheese, and, you know, please come along. You know, but she, she, she met them in their own space, in their own time, and, you know, people would eventually warm up, you know, so, so what are you doing here, you know, and she would answer these questions in as, uh, as professional way as possible. And it had a very important effect, because uh, parrots, citizens in general, are um, threatened by poaching, by trafficking, and there were people in the adjoining communities and in her own communities that were still involved in these things. But because she had developed this trust, people understood what she was about, um, who she was, what she was doing. They supported her, and when uh, these issues came up, there was enough social capital built, enough social pressure built, that people actually resisted people who would have tried to destroy her project. And it's powerful because can you imagine what would have happened if they really thought this person was terrible? You know, maybe they would have encouraged the poaching, for example. You know, encouraged negative things that would have impacted on conservation. But through simple steps in terms of breaking down barriers, meeting people who they are, building trust and transparency, and a basic understanding, then she was able to work beyond her own identity. She was able to do successful work, and she was able even more so to have positive meanings in terms of what parrots mean, what conservation mean. So she was, even without maybe actively trying to do that, teaching people uh, and creating positive behaviors and attitudes towards conservation. So I think, you know, what you said, uh, all, all we've been saying, is very, very important in practice. I really, really support what you've said there, and I, and I agree with it. Um, I know in my community, when, when researchers and what have you come in, um, just, just the... Um, their ability to communicate, especially if you're going to be working with elders and what have you, they won't open up. You're not going to get accurate information. You're not going to get, you had talked about that self-identity. You're not going to truly know who the individual is. And if you don't know the individual, you're not going to know the community or become part of that community. Um, so the, the quality of the information or the quality of the project and all of that kind of stuff is really going to to be diminished by it. And I think in conservation, many times we see people who come to do, uh, uh, in the Caribbean we see this as well, people who come to do research from far away and, you know, they walk onto the beach and take charge, you know, and, you know, never mention to anybody what they're doing there or walk into the forest or jump over a fence or whatever. And, you know, these things, th there's a certain, even a very basic level in terms of just respecting people and their own spaces that, you know, these are the spaces that people have been living and working in. 
And if I can riff off of that a little bit more, whenever I'm doing a project where I'm going into another country, another culture, I will go and the first thing I do is I take as much of my team as I can and we visit all the places where we think we want to work and we introduce the project. We have um, people who live there who are contacts that come and we talk and we share and we ask, answer any questions before we do a smidge of research. We try to hire people who are from those communities and then we go away. And I might go away for like a month. And what's that time for? That time is for the people who are in that community to talk about us, to be like, what do you think of her? What do you think of that guy? And for them to begin to like build, oh, well, I think that's okay. I think that that's a good idea. We should have that. And there'll be some communications back and forth over that time. And then we go back and we do the research. You can't ambush people and say, well, we had this meeting to introduce the project, and then the next day we were out in the field. You have to give them time and space where you aren't there looking over their shoulder, being very American in the developed world or whatever, um, waiting for them to make up their mind to let you do this conservation work. So I build that into all of my grants, the idea that we're going to fly the whole team to Costa Rica to just say hi and then go home and then come back in a month to start the work. Real challenges with cross-cultural communication. Um, we were having a conversation earlier about how, how challenging it can be that unless you have a sender and a receiver that speak the same language and have the same cultural framework, cross-cultural communication can be extraordinarily challenging. Um, when people come into our community, when scientists, uh, researchers come into our community and have a project in mind, um, they oftentimes come to the um, come to the tribal council, our governing body, and rarely do they come to the culture committees, the the places where the culture bearers are, um, and and begin to build that um, connection with with the cultural community. And our elders and our culture bearers are really where. Um, a great depth of, of knowledge lies, but uh, one of the reasons code talkers were so incredibly effective is that um, they spoke the same language, they saw out of the same um, cultural worldview. So as senders and receivers, they were, they were in perfect sync. When, um, when non-tribal researchers come onto the reservation with a, with a brilliant project. Um, uh, they're oftentimes speaking the same language, but from a very different cultural framework, and that can be extraordinarily challenging. I was having a conversation last night with a, um, with a young conservation scientist from British Columbia who talked about that challenge, coming into a community and her attitude of open-heartedness that she was really there wishing to cross cultural boundaries with a sense of, of openness. And I found that attitude um, so incredibly, um, so incredibly encouraging and hopeful. I, I, I sometimes find that, um, um, I sometimes don't find that to be the case. So. <laughs> So deep listening and meeting people where they are is something I'm hearing over and over. So are there some other challenges? I mean, we don't want to make this all sound hunky-dory and rosy because we know there are challenges. Are there some other challenges that we want to bring up and then maybe some, some things you have done to overcome those challenges? I just got back from the uh, Smith Fellow 15 year anniversary event that um, was in Sealy Lake, just an hour from here. And one of the things they had us do while we were there is they had covered the wall with a timeline going up to today and back into deep history. And they had these lines of ecological events, legislation, human events, and they wanted us to populate this with pivotal moments in history. And so here you have that 50-some of the Smith Fellows um, starting to cover it with these post-it notes. And what I recognized was beyond 1950, before 1950, it was virtually a desert 
of understanding. And I thought, how can this be? It's even worse for some of the human dimensions. Legislation seemed to start in 1973 with Endangered Species Act. Um, I was even struggling beyond things that had to do with my direct research. And I thought, whoa, how can we be effective in doing what we need to do if we don't know the history of conservation before 1950? And then I started looking around the room, and I'm gonna look around this room and ask this question. So how many people, and code how you want, code yourself as a natural scientist of some sort? Hands up, hands up, okay. Who here considers themselves a social scientist? You can be in multiple groups. Much fewer. Who here considers themselves a humanist in the humanities, philosophy, ethics? Okay. That is a better mix than it was for the Smith Fellows, but there's basically, I realized in our community, not enough of that to go around. And I thought to myself, where are the environmental historians? Where are the environmental ethicists? The, um, we talked about conservation psychology. We had one of our fellows give a presentation on us, but that wasn't what he did. Where are the, the philosophers, the ethicists? We need more of those in this space to inform our work as scholars and researchers, not just kind of borrowing their work to as best we understand it and then plopping it into our research. We need them partnered with us to do our cross-cultural conservation better because their, um, the depth of their scholarly understanding probably exceeds any of ours if that's not our field, no matter how interested we are, no matter how much of a value that we see in it. And so that really drove home to me that that is one of our large challenges. Are we training um, those in those disciplines? Are we recognizing those disciplines as part of this community? Are we welcoming them into this space? Are we adding them into our teams? Um, do our educational core programs and in universities include environmental ethics and philosophy, conservation psychology? If not, then perhaps we're not getting the skill sets. We need to do what we need to do cross-culturally. So that's a really important point, and that, that focuses, of course, in on the academic uh, community, and then there's the people who live and be and our practitioner community as well. So. I don't know, did you want to jump in here, thinking about the world starting in 1950? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to begin here, <laughs> um, because our world begins approximately 12,000 years ago, and how, how we talk about the time depth of experience, habitation, and observation in, of the natural world in this landscape, in that time depth, is, is difficult um, to translate. I, I think that how many people live in the same place that they were born? How many people live in the same place where their grandparents were born? How many people live in the same place that their, their family has lived for 12,000 years? <laughs> um, the average American move, moves eight times in their career. That's just the average American. So imagine the extraordinary resistance of living someplace in, in 12,000 years and knowing that place with a kind of depth of intimacy that's, um, that's not easily translatable. That's, for, for tribal people, um, the notion that uh, this, this time depth, this land tenure is extraordinarily difficult and challenging to to interpret for scientists and researchers that that come onto the landscape and um, might have a very different relationship with um, with this landscape than than native people. I completely and totally agree with what you say. When when you said that, actually, we were having a discussion about what Kiki had mentioned last night, and we we all started to laugh because. Um, at 19, well, in 1950, um, for my First Nation, we had just, um, the Alaska Highway was just finished. So uh, for a lot of the First Nations, they hadn't had any European contact until the Americans started building the Alaska Highway in the 1940s. So for, for, for these people, um, in fact, there's a story my husband's, uh, grandfather, when, when the U.S. Air Force moved into a little community called Aishai, um, as a gift, they, they knew that the chief was in, in, in the village, uh, they took him a cow. And he, he had no concept 
of what this white person was doing with this brown animal. He had never seen one. Um, and that poor cow stood tied to a tree for three days before, um, Chief Albert Isaac was his name, before he took it back and tried to, to express that, that no, thank you, but kind of no. And, and um, <laughs> but it, it just kind of shows that, that um, we've been the, the, for First Nations communities and what have, and, and, and other um, indigenous people around the world who have that long, long history with the land and with the animals and the birds and the trees that are on there and their intimate relationship with their surroundings um, that, that it's not, there, there is definitely a way that you need to communicate with them more so than, than um, not. So um, earlier I heard with the buffalo story that there were, um, what, what you were saying was that the decision makers at the table were drawing on this deep history of knowledge that, that comes from living in the land for 12,000 years or more, but, but also the, the scientific evidence that, that um, academics were bringing to the table and that both were important in the decision making process. And, and that's one of the challenges, I think, too, right, is, is figuring out ways to take the qualitative information and the quantitative information and the traditional and uh, contemporary local ecological knowledge and bringing in scientific ways of doing. And each group has a different set of validation of knowledge and information. And um, so how are you working to find ways to, to avoid or uh, deal with a conflict when different knowledge bases or different perspectives may bring different potential solutions? Yeah, um, that, that is, has always been a challenge and it, it definitely remains a challenge. Um, for us, everyone's dubbed it traditional knowledge or traditional eco ecological knowledge, that kind of stuff. And there's still a big question um, I guess with, with outs I'm going to say outsiders, don't, don't take it as a negative, um, but it basically I'm just saying any, anybody that besides my First Nation, I guess, um, for, for them to, to consider our information as just as important as scientific information, there's a lot of people still question the validity of traditional knowledge or local knowledge. Um, I've never, and there again, that, that's one of the challenges is because I've never questioned the validity of my own knowledge and the knowledge of my elders. And when, we, when I sit down and talk to my elders, it's, it's um, I can understand the information, I know how to interpret the information, um, I know the best way of using the information and how it should be applied. The, the challenge is, is for us to take our information and put it or apply it to, to a project, whether it's with governments or, or researchers, in a way that it's meaningful and, and um, can, can tell the whole story. Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, feeding on what you all have said, these issues of scientific knowledge versus local knowledge, one thing in terms of working cross-culturally that we, we need to, to remember is that Sometimes people who are, and I'm speaking of myself, in terms of us as the well-educated conservationists or the local manager, we feel that we know what people believe and we understand the social system. They need buffalo, they need bison. Exactly. But many times we, we really don't. Um, and we forget as well that, you know, when we're working in communities, what people believe, that's their reality. You know, that's what's going to drive how they, um, their actions, how their, their perceptions, everything. Um, so we need to understand what those are. I'm just thinking about my own research on uh, Dominica and uh, the, the conservationists did not understand that people believed that a highly endangered uh, parrot that the population had been convinced that this was a crop pest. And um, so, of course, because they didn't 
know this or it didn't seem uh, something of importance, they didn't try to, to, to address it. But then people were basing their actions in terms of the perception of an animal as bad and evil, even though this was the furthest from the truth, was then directing their actions. And so interventions in terms of dealing with basic issues of conservation, parrot conservation, etc., weren't getting anywhere, weren't being accepted. But because the, 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 uh, there was no process in place to kind of get at what these basic uh, uh, beliefs were. And as Kiki and, and Eleanor have hinted at, sometimes, you know, we can meet with a few people in, 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 a, in a landscape and they share our beliefs, you know, and we hang out with these people. And we might even have a meeting at which people are, 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 are present with different beliefs. But if there's not a process in place in terms of, as, as you said, you know, the solutions overcoming these barriers to then pull out these beliefs, these ideas, these perceptions that people might have. You know, uh, I mentioned to Eleanor that sometimes you could have a community meeting and there, there's, there's a group of three people in the back and they're really quiet. You know, they're not saying everything. Everyone in the front is really chatty and stuff like that. But those three people are the people who are going to go out and spread um, things about your project and completely derail your work. And if there's a way to kind of bring them to the table, include them, get those ideas and thoughts out, then you can at least have the opportunity to address them. So potentially address misperceptions or at least embrace what it is that there are concerns of there. So I think I hear what you're saying is that one thing we should be really careful about, like the example I explained to you early on, because I was working with communities and doing deep listening and getting to know them, before I put out my conservation biology persona, I was thought of as one type of a person, and the community in Hawaii that I was working with thought that conservation biologists were all the same, right? We all have the same values, we all have the same beliefs, but what I hear from you is that communities are diverse, conservation biology community is diverse, so that there are a lot of different representations, even within a heading that we might consider um, uniform, I guess. You know that you've done what you need to do when they start giving you work to do. And sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes we, we forget as well that, let's say, even if we have done a survey, the majority of people support conservation. You know, many times it's not the majority that matters. It's that small elite or the, the, the people who are setting the arguments that are then going to really drive how things work at that local level. Great. I'm going to let um, you say something, but in the meantime, let's take some questions from the audience. So come up to the microphone, and then um, while Jermaine is, uh, is saying what she wanted to say. Thank you. I so appreciate Leo's comment on inclusivity, that attitude of inclusivity. We've developed a couple of education projects. Um, one is called Explore the River, about um, a watershed scale restoration project that includes both traditional ways of knowing and understanding and the best science and technology. We began with uh, bringing in um, technical folks and then we began to train our crews. The other project I brought was a project called Fire on the Land and this talks about our relationship with fire traditionally and we believe these are projects of inclusivity where we, br where we bridge the gap between traditional ways of knowing and understanding and the best science and technology. And in, it is appropriate for me to have a giveaway as, a, as someone here who, is, um, who has um, welcomed you. So I brought copies of Fire on the Land and Explore the River. So if any of you would like those after the q and A, I'd, I'd be delighted to, to gift you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. So we'll take a question from over here. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Mike Vanderman from uh, California. Uh, do you believe in serendipity? <laughs> uh, did anyone ever wake up in the middle of the night with a brilliant idea that you just have to get up and turn on the light and write it down before you forget it? That's what happened to me last night. Excellent. And everything that's happened this morning has all connected together. So my idea was that we need a better means of communication. We have a couple of journals. Ever try to get something unusual into the journal? Uh-uh. Uh, the journals are inadequate. Uh, they're necessary, but um, 
They're not fast enough to get information out fast. We need a, uh, an internet forum. That, uh, <clears throat> uh, they used to be called uh, news groups, but a place where everyone is <clears throat> accepted, can, can come in and, and, and write something and immediate, instantly reach the, the rest of the, of the conservation community. Uh, all languages work. You don't have to seg necessarily segregate by language or any other way. But uh, I just want to throw that. I, I'm going to do it. Excellent. <laughs> Love to hear that. <laughs> Sounds good. Interesting. Great. Do we have a questioner over here? Well, sorry to jump in, but uh, I'm Chris Filardi. Um, but uh, I just had to ask this because uh, when, when you guys were talking about meeting people where they are, and Leo, your stories, and I know you guys, well, last night we had a bunch of stories. Does this mean that not everybody can work every, everywhere? And I'd be interested to hear about, from you guys, are there sometimes when a person, a conservation biology biologist comes in and maybe is just incompatible with Jamaica and should be heading up to you know, the flathead to work with Jermaine instead of hanging out with Leo drinking rum and playing dominoes? <laughs> Yeah, if you don't like rum, you're in trouble in Jamaica, right? <laughs> That's a great question, Chris, and um, would be very interested in hearing what other people have to say. I think for me, many times we can overcome our identities, um, and it might mean working with uh, uh, somebody who is uh, the head of a community or a sounding board, as, as, as we said, or a key informant, somebody who can uh, 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 walk us through that process. Um, um, you know, the, the, the various things we spoke about in terms of the understanding the ethics and the professionality of working within that cultural context. But there might be instances where it's really not appropriate, you know, for example, um, uh, instances where there are wars, you know, or, or overt conflicts that uh, threaten us as individuals or um, ideological things which at that point in time cannot be overcome, that it's just not the time and place. And I think people in marketing and business understood the, understand this very well. Um, I was very impressed on a vacation trip I took to Mexico, and uh, there was somebody who was trying to sell me something. But uh, they understood these issues of identity, and they tried their best to match who was going to come and speak with me to their perception of who I, who I was. Because obviously they thought it was going to make it easier for me to kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know get beyond the identity and get to the product, so to speak. So, I mean, these are important considerations. So, just to summarize, I think that it, in some instances it could be um, inappropriate or impossible, but in many instances we can overcome our identities uh, through, through various mechanisms. I think in the, in the interest of, uh, do you have, are you desperate? Because we have some good questions too, so if, jump in and interrupt me if you want, but otherwise we'll keep moving on. Yeah. All right. Healy. My name is my name's Healy Hamilton, and I'm chief scientist at NatureServe. And I wanted to ask a question, but sort of common. I've had the option to do a lot of uh, remote area research on charismatic megafauna in the Amazon and in Pacific Islands. And one of the ways that I feel I've had the best impact on those villages is, is, is to approach with humility and awe about what those villages had all around them. And the, the idea that a, you know, a, a white woman scientist would go deep into the Amazon to come there to study what they had, really, they hadn't themselves recognized, like, why would someone come here to study this? This is just what's all around us all the time. And so, uh, and the same thing in Pacific Islands, like, why are you coming all this way just to you know, look for these crazy fishes? Like, why, why would you do that? And so to, I just wanted to ask, you know, what do you think is the, the potential power of sharing that you've come all this way to understand the biodiversity that's in the world that's all around them and that they may not see, and that that in turn inspires them to look at their own diversity of life in another way? I'm going to jump in really quick just to um, make the point that in the case of 
Jamaica Pirate Project, it was an exact same scenario. You know, here was somebody who obviously by virtue of their uh, identity as an American, by virtue of their race, was somebody of power and influence. Why would you come and look at pirates? Mm -hmm. And because she engaged with the community, she, people had a vested interest to kind of understand and see through her eyes what was happening. Great. Did you have something? To add to that, that um, um, it, it takes time um, and you almost have to go at it as you want to become part of the community. You want to, you want to invest your time and um, it, show that you have an interest in, in the community itself. And it, by doing that, the community will respond. So we spend a lot of time talking about scientists working with communities elsewhere. There are lots of other boundaries that we have <clears throat> to be thinking about. So hopefully some of the questions will elicit those, um, those boundaries as well. Not to put you on the spot there, young man. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh Selberg from Simon Fraser University. Um, we, you've talked about the importance of, of working with communities and I'm wondering what have you found to be the most effective way to build capacity in local communities so that they can continue the, the research long after you're gone? I can, capacity, there's no doubt about it. When you get meat and potatoes and, and with my First Nation, um, it, capacity is a big issue. We, we don't have the, the money or, or the people basically to do what needs to be done all the time. And in fact, the other day I was talking with one of your uh, counterparts, Terry, um, he works in, in the park, and he said that in your nation there's about 1,600 people totally working all, all around within, within tribal, tribal government. Yeah. Um, my department has two. So, yeah, capacity is an issue. And so how we get around that, well, I, I try and encourage students and everything on a yearly basis, and um, it doesn't matter to me if they come back to the First Nation. What, it, what matters is, is we've taken kids and we've given them some exposure both to the, the scientific end, but I try and make sure I match that up so that they've got their traditional half too um, and move forward that way. And I think capacity is always going to be an issue um, for most First Nations trying to, to do stuff. Um, we just just don't have the resources. I would just like to challenge the idea of the long after you've gone, because isn't that so much how we do work sometimes? You go, you go in the field, you do a project, and then you're gone. But what does it mean to maintain a relationship with that community even when your grant is done? And do you have an obligation as a researcher to do that? How much did you extract from that community in terms of information, resources, time? And what do you owe them? So for me, I feel like I am continuing to build relationships even when my project is done. I want them to continue to think well about me and my team. And so there are small things that I do. Um, if I see a grant that comes through that I go, oh, this could address a concern that this organization has. I know that they have all these records that are on paper that aren't digitized. And there's a program in the US government that will digitize this for free. And so then they have more access to their information. I'm going to tell them about it. And I continue to do that for years. Can you do that with every project? Probably not. Should you have a commitment to one or two? Think about that. That might be ethically something that you should have a commitment to. Thank you, that's great. Ray? Hi there. Um, my name is Ray Wynn Grant. This has been a fantastic conference and I've really enjoyed this panel, thank you. Um, Chris's question um, is influencing mine a little bit. So I fully embrace the concept of um, finding common ground with communities in which you're working um, and building trust and building these relationships over time. Um, and I'm curious a little bit if anyone has an opinion or if anyone has a personal experience in which it's beneficial to be different, um, in which it can be helpful or actually a benefit to your work to be ignorant about the system or very new and very different um, and stand out that way. Does anyone have something to say about that? this question because <laughs> with my research it is not uncommon for people to say oh I heard about you you're that black girl going around talking about like uh, Ted's 
And that's literally what people say to me, like, to my face. But I'm okay with that. <laughs> and the reason why is, one, I know people are talking about my project. I'm standing out. There are other people who have come through, all throughout the Southeast talking about Turlick scooter devices for the past 30 years. But because I look different from all the other ones, then yes, they're spreading the word. It's kind of an experience for them to get to talk to me in some of these communities where there either are a lot of black people or black people are kind of segregated away or they've never seen a black person who's educated. I mean, this is a reality. And so it creates a space for them to go, I want to see this person. It's kind of an oddity. Yeah, come sit in my house and talk to me for a while. It also creates, I think, a little extra latitude that they give me where they don't have an expectation that I'm going to understand everything about the way they live, because clearly I don't. I'm completely different from them. They don't know any black people, so why should I understand them? And that creates some grace in our conversation. So I love that, but to do that, that means that I have to be okay if an older 70-something shrimper calls me a colored woman. I don't hold that against him. That is part of his deep history. Colored was an acceptable turn. And is he saying that to me? He's not trying to be derogatory. It's just kind of part of what his history was. And so when I build teams of people, I look for folks who are comfortable with their novelty being the entrance into a conversation. Um, I have fishermen who say, of course, I'll talk to you. You're a pretty young lady. Some people will take offense to that, but that is your opening door for a broader conversation. And so I ask and query and see if people are comfortable with the fact that their difference might be the sole reason why someone's willing to talk to you. Yep, and it goes back to the, the question that was, was asked um, earlier about the, the lady who um, spoke about her gender, etc. That, you know, you can turn these things to strengths and uh, use these as leverage points for, uh, for, for talking about your work. And also, I just want to point out, um, going back to the, the, the question as well, that the, um, the, the, the reverse is also true. So when I started my PhD, um, I wanted to work in the Caribbean, but my, my, um, my good advisors and um, uh, committee members suggested that I, did, I should not do my work in my own island. And the reason why they did that was that they understood that I would have taken certain things for granted. You know, sure, you know, I know what farming is about. I understand these things. I understand these questions. Going to a different island, however, where the, um, the, the, it, it's new, then the, 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 um, the, the mindset in terms of asking critical questions and then using a process, actually the process that I ended up using was a, a research method called grounded theory, which is an iterative method that you collect data, you analyze it, you discuss it with your, um, your, your, your advisors, your committee, you go back and you use that as a basis for further interventions until you build your final instruments that you're actually going to use to collect your data. So it was an entire process, and if I had done my work in my own country, the results that I would have found would have been, um, would have been less meaningful for all the stakeholders and, my, and myself. So embracing difference and not just trying to cover it up or, or, um, or meld. Okay, yes. Hi, my name's Cheryl Hetkevich. I'm with uh, WCS Canada, we're a large NGO. Um, thank you very much for this panel. This is very important. Most of the landscapes we work in uh, either have indigenous peoples or local and traditional societies. Um, my Cheryl, course, do you mind speaking up just a little bit? I, I sure. can't hear you so well. Better? Um, so most of the communities we work in have indigenous peoples or local and traditional communities. Um, and in Canada, obviously, there's also issues around rights, traditional rights, uh, treaty rights, aboriginal rights, rights as well. I'm interested, though, um, on the spectrum of research, um, where, whether you have any examples where you've actually co-created research with communities. In many cases, it sounds like you're on a grant, you go in, you have an idea, you want to get to know the community, you, you test your idea, you may have some long-standing relationships with them and as you leave that community as well. But have got good examples where you've co-created research with communities and that's been sort of the starting point. So oftentimes just the opposite is the case for us. Um, we'll initiate a project and then we'll search for uh, for partners or collaborators. Um, we have a particular 
project in mind and we need some outside expertise. So we'll call on, we'll invite experts to come in and, and work with us. So lots of different ways to do this. It can be a scientist who says, <clears throat> I have a neat idea for a project. I need to go to a community, think about how to work on that, um, and get to know people before I really, and co-create the idea or reform the, uh, reformulate the idea, an idea that, or a thought that's coming from indigenous communities or population that's living in a place and then reaching out to other experts to help. You have other examples? Um, more and more so uh, with our First Nation, I mean, we, we always have a lot of researchers coming to us. And of course, we've got the two governments that are coming to us with projects that they want to do too. Um, but more and more, we're seeing that it's, it's our priorities and us developing programs that we want to s implement within our traditional territory and going out and, and sourcing and, and finding help. Uh, for example, with, with the bison stuff, um, I had mentioned that we had a whole bunch of concerns about associated social and environmental impacts. Um, and we wanted those addressed, so we had developed a relationship actually with, with Doug Clark, um, and we had conducted uh, a social and environmental assessment, impacts assessment report. And there's been several other ones, um, grizzly bear work, there's been um, for uh, moose work, uh, there was a large caribou recovery project that our First Nation um, had identified an issue and, and helped develop. Um, there's been lots of, uh, we've developed water strategies um, we're doing our own land use planning. Um, it, it goes on and on and on kind of thing. And I think more and more you're going to see that because I had mentioned a little bit earlier, capacity. Capacity is an issue. And like any organization or anything, you're going to, if you only have so much resources, you're going to identify your priorities. So I think you're going to see more and more um, from First Nations communities, it's going to be our priorities and we're going to take it to the academic world and say, okay, this is what we want to do um, and develop something. Great. I think we have another question over here. Uh, thanks for this this morning. This is really helpful. My name is Karsten Hoyer. I'm with the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. And this has really helped, I think, through some things about sort of cultural boundaries that aren't necessarily as uh, well defined as how they're represented here on stage today. The, you know, the, the cultures of ranching, the cultures of real estate developers, the cultures of industrial development. And you know, all, all the things we're talking about today relate to how you, how you generate good relationships there as well. And, and the common themes are things like deep listening, uh, you know, meeting people where they are, developing the trust, and, and, and that all takes a tremendous amount of time. And so my question is, we're also all swept up in this sort of almost a revolution of technology where there's more competition for time and there's more distractions. And I would just ask, do you feel like the, the, the bridging that's required is actually becoming more pronounced because of those constant distractions? Are those issues, you know, as relevant in your your respective cultures as they are in sort of broader Western humanity, uh, that kind of for me is a like is this thing all getting worse in a way because of technology? Interesting question. What I found is no, but I think it's the nature of my work is that I go to people in their homes and I talk to them. And that is the antithesis of the technology way of communicating. It's old school. I sit over a food or coffee or tea and I say, what's your concern here? And that stands out now. People don't take the time to do that. Um, and even my team in the field, where um, sometimes they want to have someone do a survey, which takes a lot of time. And, uh, my best field coordinator would always say, well, we can't promise anything will change, but we want to hear your voice. Has anyone else come here to ask you your thoughts on this? And the people would stop and they go, well, no. And they say, well, we're here to listen. That's what we can promise is we'll listen. And that was enough. 
so many people change their minds about whether or not they want to spend time with this hour-long survey just because we said we'd listen, and that's and different. Just to add as, as, as well, so um, what I hear the, the gentleman saying as well is this issue of the practitioner, the person who is there, there is industry, there are ranchers, and there are all these different stakeholders. I think many times that in conservation we're caught up in what we could describe as the fierce urgency of now. You know, species are going extinct, we need to act now, we need to get the biologists' feet, the boots on the ground, we need to raise populations and all this other kind of stuff. And as you said, then these issues of engagement become, we don't have time for that. You know, but if we look at how um, uh, uh, um, uh, business works, you know, everything from Coca-Cola to, to, um, to, to Microsoft, you know, they realize just as how we would like our species to be there into the future, they're hoping that their products are going to stand the test of time. And that means engaging with the others, you know, understanding who their constituents are, understanding how they think, their values, and then working with an understanding of that to how they present their products. And I don't think that conservation has that, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word, um, liberty anymore. You know, to say that we don't have time. We absolutely have to make the time to understand who we're working with, their values, and meeting them, as we said, where they are, and then it's, it's for the benefit of the long-term uh, uh, work of conservation. Go ahead. Just, just to add to that, I, I totally, totally agree with you. And I think um, working with communities for, as, as an example, um, the engagement part and the communication part, I can't stress how important that is because that's going to put, that's, that's the base of your relationship. No matter what, what the research is, no matter what, whether it's, it's um, to do with logging, to do with saving a species or what have you, if you want um, a good positive outcome, you have to build the foundation for a good positive relationship. And to do that, you need to engage. Um, I, I, that's one thing that I can't stress the importance of more enough. I'm gonna preempt um, <clears throat> lines and have Lauren go next. <laughs> She's holding a baby, so. <laughs> so um, one thing I wanted to add is that I think it's important that we recognize that we bring our own preconceived notions to situations sometimes um, about the way that we think that people might treat us or might look at us that might actually not be right. So my experience was doing research up in the northeastern um, lower peninsula of Michigan, which is a very white, conservative, hunting gun, gun club culture where their idea of a biologist is like a white man who works in the DNR. So this black girl from suburban Northern Virginia just wasn't, or at least I thought, wasn't going to be um, a viable or, or serious um, consideration for them. And so even my advisor at the time had cautioned me about working up there. I was by myself. I didn't have um, a field team or anything. And so she had just said, like, Lauren, just I want you to be, be careful, put your safety first before your research, and just get out of there if you need to. Um, <laughs> and so I took a lot of my own fear and my own prejudices, I guess, up into my field site. And so one day I was up doing some bird research, and um, there was this big pickup truck <laughs> on the side of the road that's um, gun rack that slowed down and of course my heart just dropped in my stomach and I thought like oh my god I'm on like private land and I didn't know it and someone's about to like the clan like whatever and It was this man who got out and he was worried about me because he says there are a lot of bear in this area Are you okay? <laughs> and so I was just shocked that That was his response to seeing me the other in his area and then he wanted to know like what are you doing up here? And when I told him I was you know, a biology student and I was doing research on brown-headed cowbirds, and he, oh, what are those? And I explained, oh, I have those. I've been feeding those. And we just, <laughs> we just had this great. really nice interaction and discussion. And it was a learning yeah. moment, not just for him from a biological standpoint, but for me from a cultural standpoint, that we can't go into areas where we identify ourselves as the other and assume that people there think of us that way too. 
So I just wanted to make that, that point. Great, great. I know we only have five minutes left, so we have to be really picky about it. I want to be sure to <clears throat> all the folks who've been standing up for a little bit get to them, and then the panelists are going to have a last minute um, summary as well. So Ron, quick, quick question. Well, she's, this lady stood before me. Let her go. Oh, and then sorry. I'll... Okay. This lady. <laughs> and do Thank introduce you yourself, much. please. Thank you very much. I'm Fasuma Olaleru from Nigeria. I'm very much interested in the discussion for this morning. But I just want to make comments. Mine is not a question. Fine, uh, being on the field, uh, many a times when I go there, the people want to uh, find out what do I want to give them. So I think when we are going out for work, we should have that in mind that people will think we have something to give them. They want some benefits, immediate benefits. So uh, the issue of conserving or wanting to study what they have or what not may not be their primary interest. What they will be interested in is what will they gain. So let them realize that though they have resources and you want to study them, you will want to document them for their future generation to use. So that's critical. Let them know about that. And then the issue of relationship has been emphasized. I, I won't talk much on that, but I want to say that once we finish our work and we leave, we keep on touch because we will not be the last researchers going there. Some other folks will come because when I uh, um, attended the plenary sessions and the uh, parallel sessions I discovered a lot of Americans come to Africa to do work and they will keep on coming. And um, when we go, lay, lay a good example, subsequent uh, Americans coming will work on that terrain and the relationship will continue. Now, Great. I want to say that it's good we build in our budget for those of us that will be working on uh, funding the issue of uh, the uh, building into the budget, um, the cost for souvenirs, because when you go with souvenirs, something valuable to them, they will appreciate it, and they know that you have their interests at heart. That, Wonderful, just thank you so comments. much. Thank you. So a couple of, of summaries, the technology can be a distraction, but can also keep you in touch with your community, with the community with which you're working afterwards. And um, the issue of budget, I think, is key, because we're all sitting here thinking to ourselves, OK, I have to fly to Costa Rica, Costa Rica twice, once to meet people, and then the second time to, to work with them to do the work we're doing, which, which isn't necessarily supported, or some of the things that our, our previous uh, speaker just spoke about aren't necessarily supported in our, in our uh, philanthropy system and the, the sources of money for what we're doing. So this is a culture change across all the different connections that we have in, in our work as researchers, in our work as practitioners, and, and in the financial philanthropy community. Ron? This, this has been great. Uh, Ron Abrams from New York uh, and Cape Town. Um, I, I have a dark cloud, though, and I haven't heard any. Are we so important? And imagine you have a, a project idea, you generate your proposal, you get your grant, and you go to some place, and they say, no, we want to cut the forest because we want to sell the land to this wealthy developer who's going to give us a lot of cash, and our people are poor, diseased, unemployed. We don't want you. What's your reaction to that? I think it's important to have a conversation um, if you're working in a tribal community or with, uh, um, I'll just speak about tribal communities. Um, before you submit your proposal, Think about having a discussion with that group. Make a determination whether or not you can have a partnership and whether that's information that's important um, or that the tribal community thinks will benefit them in some way. Um, we have a long history of, of people coming in with their great ideas and they want to do this for us. Um, and they gather information. We've had um, decades, uh, a century of ethnomusicologists, of anthropologists, of ethnographers, of, um, it, you know, you name it, that come to our community and, and have an attitude um, not of reciprocity, but purely of extraction. They extract information. And um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we have a paradigm shift and think about building partnerships. And rather than coming in with a with a fully developed proposal and funding and saying, you know, I have this great idea for your community. Um, have a conversation. 
I'd just like to jump in to say, great question. And um, respect doesn't mean agreement. Because there are instances where agreement will never be reached. But to quote Maya Angelou, uh, Maya said that uh, sometimes people won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And if you can at least allow people to understand that you've heard them, you respect their position, you don't agree with them, you can go a long way in terms of the long-term success and how the, the evolution of your project happens. That's a wonderful point, thank you. So being respectful of your time, I just wanna have each person maybe say one sentence or something as a, a closing thought for, for the audience. Um, say in closing that I think long term one of the things that we need to do as a discipline is think about how we educate um, conservation biologists while they're in school and as Kiki and others have said that uh, many times there are many ethical concerns that people invariably because we have not been so schooled and mentored that we can get into that can affect our work and if this becomes a part of our formal education system, then I think that our, it, it, will, it will be an important step in terms of how um, uh, conservation happens on the ground. I think if, for me, uh, in a closing remark, I, uh, hearing what everybody's talked about today and, and the questions that have come forward, I think what, what I'd like to close with is, is partnerships are true relationships and communication in those partnerships are one of the most important things to build the foundation. I, again, want to thank um, the organizers, Chris and Eleanor, for convening this panel and inviting us to be here today. I think that this kind of cross-cultural communication can go a long way. This, this fledgling, fledgling start can begin to build bridges of communication, but more than that, build bridges of understanding across cultures and, and communities. So again, um, I want to most warmly welcome you here. I hope your stay here is um, that you learn and gather everything that you want from this experience. And thank you again. I think what I've been most impressed about this morning is the honesty in this room um, of sharing things that I think are a little bit vulnerable, a little bit personal, and a fuller identity than just the conservation biologist who has this paper that they want to talk about at this conference. And I would urge all of us to continue to own a little bit of that, to be our fuller selves in this space, because the more that we know the depth of our identities, our heritage, our values, we become a resource to each other when we're trying to do this cross-cultural work. And if all we know of each other are our professional faces and the papers that we publish, then we're shackling ourselves and denying ourselves the resources we have right here in this room. So let's just keep that honest identity flowing. Wonderful. So thank you, Jermaine, for welcoming us here and for sharing this ancestral land with us. And um, I think what we've heard is the importance of developing trust and developing transparency and deep listening. And I thank you all for doing your deep listening and thinking as you leave from this uh, plenary, how can I work across difference? How can I recognize difference? How can I listen and share um, my experiences and learn from others with, with respect? So um, please join me in thanking this terrific panel. Um, can I just put DVDs right there?